There is a lot going on in the Marvel stat patch today from an Eliath nerf to a Chavez rework to a whole bunch of new features coming. Let's go ahead and dive right on into the details and let you know my thoughts on where all of these things leave Marvel snap headed. I've never won to bury a lead, so let's talk about the card that I've cared the most about changing, been very vocal about up until this point, and that's Eliath. Eliath is now a 6-2 with the on reveal destroy all unrevealed enemy cards here. Second and Earth starts their analysis of the Eliath change by noting that it's always had kind of an interesting position in Snap since it was added. It's had a pretty acceptable average win rate and cube rate, but a bad reputation. For good reason. No one likes their turn six getting deleted. They've monitored the performance and they thought that Eliath would ultimately drop off over time as people got more experience with it, but that hasn't helped. The longer Eliath has remained out, the more commonplace it has become, so they've decided to take action. From a pure design perspective, I think the change they've made to Eliath makes a lot of sense. Whenever the Snap Design team has talked about their goals for Eliath in the past, they noted that they designed it to be a card that rewarded players for having priority. The problem, in my opinion, with Elias' previous design was that while it accomplished rewarding you for having priority, it didn't have sufficient drawback in situations where you weren't in an ideal setup. While there were a handful of cards such as Doctor Doom that got value against an opposing Elias flipping up, by and large, a lot of the things your opponents were doing on turn six were dying to Elias even if that Elias was going second. By making Elias be a card that explicitly cares about having priority to be effective, it's a accomplishing the goal that second dinner set out for this card to have while also creating a real risk to this powerful reward that Eliath is able to generate. Well, there's definitely some niche spots such as opposing copies of Invisible Woman or the location Dark Dimension where this Eliath change is more powerful than the previous design. On average, I expect this Eliath change to be a downgrade, meaning that the card is less powerful on average and hopefully less popular and less commonplace and less frustrating because of it. Our second major change in the patch this week is a complete and total redesign to the card America Chavez. She is now a 2-3 with the on reveal effect the top card of your deck gets plus 2 power. Seconder notes that they redesigned Chavez because from a philosophical perspective, she wasn't functioning how they want people to have game pieces function in Marvel Snap. She isn't a card that most decks that played her often wanted to play, and she wasn't used for any type of fun synergies. She was a card that just gave you a small statistical edge in decks that wanted to be more consistent in the first five turns of the game by allowing you to effectively play with an 11 card deck at the cost of having your draw on that final turn be deterministic. While there were some small exceptions to this rule, such as discard decks playing Dracula or lockjaw decks that occasionally like flipping the nine power body into play, by and large, most decks playing Chavez were just using her to thin their deck and not as a functional game piece. Second dinner notes that decks that were previously playing Chavez are obviously going to be weakened by this change and they're going to be keeping an eye on those to see if they need to perhaps buff their pieces or introduce new pieces to add consistency back into them. That being said, some of the highest performing Chavez decks such as Loki and Bounce honestly probably deserved a decrease in their consistency as they have been top performing decks in the metagame for a while and I'm going to be interested to see if the removal of Chavez as this hyper consistent game piece makes those decks perform at a more reasonable level. As for Chavez's new design, this 2-3 that gives plus 2 to the top card of your deck, Second Dinner notes that they wanted something that was relatively simple and clean because America Chavez is still a Series 1 card that players gain access to early. However, this new design is what they consider to be a premium stat line, i.e. 5 points of power for just 2 energy, and she's one that will enable exploration for new and old players alike since she has explicit synergy with a number of cards in the game such as Mr. Sinister, Brood, Black Panther, and even our upcoming season pass card release in Sebastian Shaw. Hits just keep coming in this patch as we have Luke Cage as our next adjustment. Previously a 2-2 with the ongoing your cards can't have their power reduced. Now a 2-3 with the ongoing your cards here can't have their power reduced. Second order starts by noting that when Luke Cage initially released, cards that reduced your opponent's power weren't all that popular, with Scorpion being the one that was played the most by and far. 
Since then, through lots of balance updates and new cards added to the game, Luke Cage has become increasingly powerful as more things have incidentally shrunk your opponent's cards. Seconder notes that in general, they're reevaluating the impact low cost cards should have and ultimately don't feel that it's healthy for them to shut off multiple higher cost cards regardless of the location that they are played at. In the future, they're going to localize more abilities like they're moving Luke Cage to in this update. Second Inner also follows up that they're aware that Luke's prominence affected other balancing and that there's definitely a chance that some power reducing cards may become too strong without Luke to rein them in and they're going to be monitoring those closely. Speaking of those cards, the next card in today's update is one of those and that is the Shadow King. Previously a 2-3 with the on reveal setting all cards here to their original base power, he is now being changed to a 2-2. Seconder notes that when they originally buffed Shadow King from a 3-3 down to a 2-3, they knew that it would be an aggressive change, but ultimately they were glad that it was one that they made. The metagame stabilized around Shadow King as a reasonable tech card that wasn't overbearing. However, in the wake of Luke Cage being adjusted, Shadow King is definitely going to be more potent and they're preemptively taking a power away from him to try and offset this change a little bit. From a Cerebro deck building perspective, this is an interesting swap for these two cards since previously Cerebro 2 enjoyed playing Luke Cage, which they'll no longer be able to do. However, Shadow King is a big pickup, allowing you to reset penalties on one of your lanes while also being an interactive card against what your opponents are bringing to the table. Up next, we have a change to Elsa Bloodstone, who was previously a 2-2 that said, if you played another card to fill a location, give it plus two power. She is now a 2-3 that says, after you play a card that fills this location, give it plus two power. Two important things to note about this change to Elsa. The first is that the timing window on her effect is changing. To give you a pointed example of how Elsa will now function differently than she did previously, is that if you play Elsa into a path on turn two, and then you play Brood into her path on turn three, the end result is you will have an Elsa two two power broodlings and a four power brood that got buffed by Elsa's effect. The other big change here obviously is that Elsa is going from being a global effect to one that only impacts her singular lane. Secondary notes that similar to the philosophical decision for Luke Cage, they decided that Elsa's multi-location buff was an element of her strength that they didn't want a two cost card to have and they want to change her to not only have the timing be a little bit more intuitive as to what a lot of players expected it, but also to make it so she only impacts a single location. Overall, I think this change is good. It makes Elsa's trigger be a little bit more intuitive for players that are interacting with the card for the first time, and it likely appropriately tones her power level down. If you're getting a single Elsa trigger over the course of the game, she's still a 2-5, which similar to the Chavez change that we talked about earlier, is a premium rate for a two drop in Marvel Snap. And you can still get Elsa's trigger multiple time over the course of the game with things like Jeff the Baby Land Shark or Vision playing into and moving out of her path or something like Kitty Pride, who is actually the next change in this patch. Kitty Pride, retaining her text of when this returns to your hand, plus one power returns at the start of each turn, but getting a point of her power back going from a starting 1-0 to a starting 1-1. Seconder comments that whenever possible, they prefer cards have at least some amount of starting power, so they're happy to give one point of power back to Kitty. They also mentioned that overall, they're not certain where the strength of Elsa and Kitty are going to end up at after this set of changes, but they're also confident that if they fall short or if they overestimate the impact, they can easily adjust one or both of these cards via a future over-the-air update. Up next, we have a pretty significant power level increase to one of Marvel Snap's recent card releases, the Black Knight. The Black Knight, for those not familiar, is a 1-2 that says, after you discard a card from your hand, add the Ebony Blade to your hand with that card's power. The Ebony Blade previously was just a 4 energy card that took on the power of whatever you discarded. With this patch today, it is gaining the ongoing effect, the Ebony Blade cannot be destroyed and its power cannot be reduced. While I won't say this change makes the Blade impossible to interact with, you could technically Rogue or Enchantress the ongoing effect away and then Shadow King or Shang-Chi the Blade itself, it does make the Blade incredibly difficult to interact with compared to how it was previously. 
honestly, I think there's a chance that this change might be one of the most impactful from this because Marvel Snap really just doesn't have any large threat like this that has this inherent built-in protection. And I'm interested to see how Black Knight with this new potent effect can potentially push the metagame that has almost always revolved around busted tech cards like Shang-Chi and Shadow King. Up next, we have a, another buff to Ravona Renslayer, keeping her same ongoing text that she's had since release, but this time she's going from a 2-1 up to a 2-3. Second dinner acknowledges that their internal playtest team clearly missed low with this card, considering she originally released as a 3-3, and even after being buffed to a 2-1, she still has yet to find a home in the metagame. They then go on to muse that the addition of Miss Marvel as a metagame staple increased the amount of ongoing hate that the format sees as a whole, which has hurt cards like Renslayer in terms of their playability. They're hoping that by pushing her power up, she can both become more efficient and perhaps potentially find a home in a Cerebro 3 style deck, which is one of the better performing archetypes that have leveraged her so far. Our next change is one that feels kind of out of left field, but has a really interesting and kind of sweet, honestly, justification for it. Thanos' Mind Stone is going from a 1-1 with the on reveal of drawing two stones from your deck to a 1-1 with the on reveal of drawing two one-cost cards from your deck. Second Inner notes that they're making this change because they've been working on designing future in-game effects that will grant a player a random Infinity Stone. They noted that when they were testing these effects, getting a random Infinity Stone often felt incredibly fun, except when you got the existing design of Mind Stone, which basically was just a 1-1 one, one for 1 with no other effect. They're making this change now ahead of adding those effects to the game to see how it impacts Thanos overall. And honestly, I don't blame them for just making this change and not doing anything else to Thanos' kit. I think there's going to be some situations where you play like a utility one drop or two in the Thanos deck and now this Mind Stone James helps you find them more consistently and it ends up being an upside. That being said, there's definitely going to be other spots where it's a net negative. So I personally am going to be interested to see where Thanos' kit ends up overall if it'll end up getting a buff in some manner as a fallout from this change. We're into the home stretch of this patch review now. We've got four more cards left to cover that are having some functionality changes, but they're all pretty closely related to each other because they're all kind of covered under this update that Second Dinner is doing to unrevealed cards mostly no longer being moved. Second Dinner notes that one of the default rules in Marvel Snap is that unrevealed cards tend to be immune to things like being destroyed, bounced, or referenced for other effects because, in general, they're not considered to be in play. This, however, wasn't true for movement effects because the more prominent movement effects at the time, Arrow and Juggernaut, both necessitated them being able to move unrevealed cards for their effect. This meant that newer content they added to the game also followed a similar rule. However, they've since decided that this largely feels like an inconsistency that adds more confusion than it's worth. So moving forward, they are standardizing move effects to only affect revealed cards by default with anything that impacts unrevealed cards explicitly saying so. So what does this mean in practice? Well, the two more recent card designs that are known for moving face down cards that will be changing with this in terms of functionality are Spider-Man as well as Stegron. The text won't change on either of these cards, but their functionality is that they will no longer be moving cards that are face down with them. Stegron is also getting an update to be a 4-6 because he, generally speaking, is an underperformer and they want to add a point of power to him to see if they can help make up for that fact. Moving along to a card that's getting a more substantial change with this consistency update, Arrow is getting a fresh text box. Previously, Arrow was a 5-8 with the on reveal, move the last enemy card played this turn to this location. Arrow will now be a 5-9 that says on reveal, move the last enemy card played anywhere to this location. The core functionality change here on Arrow is that if you're playing her while you have priority, you're going to move whichever was the last card your opponent played on the previous turn, as opposed to grabbing the face down last card that your opponent deployed on the current turn like Arrow's old design did. Second Dinner notes that in their playtesting, they felt like this ability was a little bit weaker than Arrow's previous design overall, thus giving her a ninth point of power, which also lets her stay under Shang-Chi's recent nerf. 
That being said, I really like this new design and arrow from a strategic perspective. It means that controlling your priority in a given game where you're playing her is going to allow you to either tactically move something that you deterministically know is on the board, or you could potentially throw priority going into a key turn to grab whichever card your opponent is playing out then, which is likely unknown to you. Our final change in all of this moving cards cleanup is actually not a functionality change, but just a wording change. Juggernaut is explicitly going to continue behaving as it did previously with the updated verbiage on reveal, move away all enemy cards played here this turn, including unrevealed ones. This is the exception to the moving rule that Second Dinner talked about at the start of this section, where if something can move the unrevealed cards, it's going to explicitly call it out. I think Juggernaut being the exception to this rule makes a lot of sense because at a core design perspective, this card just doesn't really function if you have to be going second in order for it to move things around. All right, all right, all right. I know I said the movement cards being tuned up was the last change for cards in this patch, but this next one technically is a bug fix and not a rework. Uh, the long standing bug with the Phoenix Force is finally being addressed in this patch, which some of you at home might not even realize was a bug. Bug. That bug is that copied Phoenix Forces lost the ability to move around the board, which they will now have. This means if your Phoenix Force gets duplicated on Sinister London or Bar Sinister, or if you're copying a multiple man, every single one of those instances of the Phoenix Force is going to be able to freely move around the board every single turn. This is honestly a pretty sizable power level upgrade in this fix to the Phoenix Force. That, combined with the fact that perhaps we'll see less Professor X with the Eliath change, could mean that this card could be a metagame force to be reckoned with. Time will tell. Either way, I'm excited to try it out. Final, final note on card updates in this patch is that Second Inner closes out with a list of 46 cards that are going to have the verbiage on their cards updated to be a little bit more clean and intuitive and concise. However, the functionality of those cards is not changing at all. If you want the exact list of those, I'm going to put that in the patch notes in the video description down below rather than reading all of them out to you here. In addition to all these card changes, the patch today is also bringing with it a number of new features, some of which seem incredibly sweet. The one that I personally am most looking forward to is the updated deck builder tool, which will allow you to put one or more cards inside of the Marvel Snap deck builder and then hit the autocomplete button, which will use data-driven analysis from all the games played on the second dinner backend to fill in the missing cards in your current deck list from things in your collection that make the most sense based on the data that Marvel Snap has for successful decks. You'll be able to do this simply by putting a single card in your deck and having it fill in 11 missing pieces. You'll also be able to import a deck from a channel like this one and say you're missing a card in it, hit that autofill button and have the second dinner deck editor automatically make a recommendation that your collection has in it. Basically, what I'm saying is I never want to hear one of you ask me for a replacement card ever again because second dinner has automated it for me. Past the deck builder, we got a bunch of small cosmetic changes and new features coming. There's going to be new emotes that you can collect and equip, including favorite ones that queue up at the top of your list. The primary way to get these new emotes is a new feature coming called albums, which will reward players for collecting variants that are inside of the same grouping. For example, there's going to be three albums right when the patch drops, Venomized Villains, Dan Hip, as well as Jim Lee X-Men, and then there will be a fourth Hellfire Gala album releasing shortly after the patch goes live. Basically, you'll get three, six, nine, or 12 variants in an album, and every time you hit one of those milestones, you'll get rewards from collecting things inside of that group. Second Dinner is also going to be added an updated avatar frame to all spotlight variant avatars, and this will be back changed for all existing spotlight avatars that you may have already collected. Finally, Second Dinner has added some new audio to a number of cards, including Hella, Ultron, Apocalypse, Infinite, Onslaught, and Arnim Zola. That was a lot, but 
honestly, I think most of it was pretty good. They either directly or indirectly whacked every top dog inside of the format while also giving us a phenomenal mix of cards that had previously been off meta as small buffs to allow us to explore. We also have new deck building considerations with America Chavez's on reveal effect, especially with the season pass card, Sebastian Shaw, that's releasing today. And I'm excited to see where it all shakes out as we head into the holiday season. It's also noteworthy that Second Dinner had previously said they were canceling over their updates for the rest of the year, but they did retroactively say that they're tentatively adding one back in on the 21st, which honestly, looking at these patch notes, I think makes a lot of sense. While it's impossible to say at the front end here whether or not they shot high or low on some of these changes, I would be shocked if some of these cards don't need further adjustments. And as is often the case, I think one of the best things about Marvel Snap is the constant iterative process which they go through to try and make things great and I'm glad to see them putting another one of those back on the menu for us. At any rate, as always, I'd love to know your thoughts on these changes, what cards you're going to be brewing with and what shells you want to try them out in. If you enjoyed my musings on this topic, be sure to snap that like button and hopefully we'll see you back again tomorrow. We'll be highlighting Sebastian Shaw and then a bunch of other fantastic new cards that got updates recently for the rest of the week.